Good morning, good afternoon and good evening ladies and gentlemen. We would like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you at the nice global conclave from the laps of the beautiful Himalayas where the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is located. The think tank was established in the month of February in the year 2016. It undertakes independent research in the field of international relations, foreign policy, security studies and development. NICE has four research centers, China Studies, Neighborhood Studies, Non-Traditional Security Studies and Security and Strategic Studies. The institute focuses on eight research topics, climate change and energy, global governance, sustainable development and smart cities, refugee and migration, China's Belt and Road Initiative, Border and Transboundary Water Politics, Indo-Pacific Affairs, Disaster Management and International Economy and Development. Previously, NICE has had the opportunity to host distinguished speakers from all around the globe. It was a great pleasure inviting me to speak here at NICE. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak with all of you. Well, thank you anyway, and I certainly admire the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you all. NICE Global Conclave is the flagship event of Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. The theme of the three-day conference is connecting Nepal to the world with the aim to bring leaders, diplomats, business leaders and scholars from all over the globe. The objective of the conclave is to introduce Nepal to the world and at the same time update the Nepalese policy makers and experts about the fast changing geopolitics which will help Nepal reshape its foreign policy to achieve its national goal. This is the 19th session of the conference and to chair and moderate this session, it is a real pleasure to have with us Dr. Jagannath P. Panda. Dr. Jagannath Panda is a research fellow and coordinator of the East Asia Center at Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, New Delhi. Dr. Panda has authored several books on China. He is a member of the editorial board of several journals and recipient of several prestigious fellowships such as Asia Fellowship, National Science Council Visiting Professorship from Taiwan, Visiting Scholar at the University of Illinois and Visiting Fellowship at the Shanghai Institute of International Studies. He is the first South Asian scholar to receive the prestigious East Asia Institute's Fellowship. Most recently, he was a Unification Fellow of the Ministry of Unification, Republic of Korea. Without any further ado, I request the Chair to take over. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Sir, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon to uh, all. Welcome to this panel. Um, it's my indeed uh, great pleasure to uh, welcome you all for this uh, session, which is titled as a China Caught in Geopolitical uh, Rivalry. Now, let me start by thanking uh, NIICE for this kind invitation to moderate this session. And my special thanks to Dr. Pramo Jaiswal, who has taken this great initiatives in the Himalayan Valley to talk and discuss about global politics, including China. Now, as I mentioned, this session is about China and the emerging geopolitical rivalry. And uh, I am particularly fortunate to have some eminent scholars, excellent uh, experts and diplomats, uh, who have actually contributed to uh, India and different countries' foreign policy in a big way. Um, and we are going to invite him to have their thoughts on the issues. Uh, before I introduce the speakers and invite them to share their thoughts, 
let me make a couple of uh, very brief um, observation. I think when we are talking about China and the uh, geopolitical rivalry, I think uh, we need to first ask uh, whether really we are really talking about this rivalry in a contemporary sense. Uh, is it really a recent phenomenon on a, and a recent development between China and the, uh, you know, the other countries in the regions? Or China is continuously being debated the way it is being debated from the 21st century? particularly since uh, the time when we have started talking about the rise of China and when rise of China has become the central attraction of world politics. So how far the Xi Jinping's um, you know, presidency, Xi Jinping's leadership has contributed to this rivalry uh, in comparison to the original discourse that we have talked about China and the rest of the world uh, from the days of China's rise in the 21st century. The second point I think um, uh, we need to really uh, probably talk about, and I would encourage each of the speakers to share their thoughts, is that um, what kind of rivalry really we are talking about between China and the rest? Uh, is it really geopolitical in nature? Or there is something more attached to it? Uh, and um, is there any historical um, you know, narrative attached to this rivalry? Uh, particularly if we try to understand between China and India, between China, and Southeast Asian countries, there is definitely a historical narrative attached to it. So with this note, maybe I would invite uh, each one of the speakers to share their thoughts. Um, and uh, those who are actually about to share the PPT, they can uh, you know, operate and uh, conduct their PPT by themselves. But let me first introduce um, uh, you know, Ambassador Nolin Suri, um, whom I have the privilege to interact with him on many occasions. He is India's former Indian ambassador to China, uh, and also he was uh, ambassador to Poland and the UK. Uh, he was actually High Commissioner, India's High Commissioner to UK, and he has actually contributed a lot on India-China relations navigating uh, during the difficult periods. So I would first invite um, Ambassador Nolin Suri to speak, um, and then we'll uh, go to Dr. Than Hai To who is the currently Deputy Chief of Mission in the Embassy of Vietnam in New Delhi. Uh, he's a dear friend of mine and who has been actually focusing on um, Vietnam and the geopolitics of the regions, including South China Sea issue for a long time. Um, and uh, it is indeed a great pleasure to have him here. We're also fortunate to have uh, Dr. Nicholas Swanstrom. Again, he's also known to me more than a decade and um, he is currently the executive director of the uh, one of the premier think tank uh, from the Nordic uh, regions, that is Institute of Security and Development Policy. He is also a fellow um, at the Foreign Policy Institute of uh, uh, Paul H. Nis School of Advanced uh, International Studies in Washington, D.C. He is a well-known China and Central Asian expert, and my privilege to have him here. I'm also um, you know, equally privileged to have uh, three other distinguished scholars. Uh, that is uh, Dr. Nyung Chung Ping. He is actually the director of Institute of China Studies um, at the University of Molloy. He is a uh, top-notch China scholar and uh, was written extensively. In fact, uh, I had the opportunity to invite him to IDSA once, but unfortunately, I think uh, uh, due to some administrative difficulties, the conference could not uh, take place, but uh, it would be a indeed pleasure to have your thoughts on, on this occasion. Then we have Professor Dr. Goran Ail. Um, he is uh, a, the Dean of Faculty of Law from the University of Bitola. Uh, and again, he covers uh, China and the European politics very closely. Then we have Dr. Roman Van Loy. He is the President of Philippines Association for China Studies. Uh, again, he's also a well-known China scholar and uh, quite frequently visible in the uh, you know, strategic circuit that covers China and the geopolitics. Uh, without really wasting much time, let me introduce, uh, invite uh, Ambassador uh, Suri to make his observation. And I would request you, sir, to share your thoughts maybe in seven to eight minutes. Then maybe we can uh, save uh, much more time for the discussion. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Panda, and thank you, Dr. Jaiswal, and nice for inviting me for this important conference. Uh, during his state visit to India in September 2014, 
President Xi Jinping delivered a major public address in New Delhi under the auspices of the Indian Council of World Affairs on 18th September 2014. His speech was entitled In Joint Pursuit of a Dream of National Revival. While his speech largely focused on the direction that bilateral relations between India and China should take, he pointedly also spoke of China's relations between India and South Asia and with China's relations with South Asia. He said about the latter, and I quote, China and countries in South Asia are important partners for cooperation. Our cooperation, like a massive treasure long awaited to be unearthed, promises great prospects for us, China. He then announced a package of targets and assistance to South Asia, covering trade, investment, concessional aid, scholarships, and training opportunities over the next five years. Lest there be any doubt about his message, he added that China is the biggest neighbor of South Asia and India is the largest country in South Asia. He then went on to pledge that China is ready to work with India and South Asia. The strategic importance of South Asia was made clear. Development since 2014 and China's approach and policies in South Asia, including through the BRI and CPEC, are part and parcel of China's continuing approach to geopolitical rivalry in South Asia. Its impact may obviously vary depending on which geography it is in South Asia that you are coming from. The truth and reality are that South Asia, especially the Himalayan region, has been a geopolitical and strategic concern for China for many centuries. The fundamental reason for this has been for China to be able to exercise control over its peripheral territorial claims, in particular over Tibet and Xinjiang. This knowledgeable audience does not need to be reminded about the so-called great game between Russia and Imperial Britain, with the agreements between Russia and China vis-a-vis -vis Britain in the past, between Tibet and the Mongols, and of course, between Tibet and China and British India. It also explained why the Communist Party of China and the PLA rushed to physically take control over the territories of Xinjiang and Tibet soon after winning the civil war in late 1949. More importantly though, this desire to exercise control over the historically maximum ever geographical expanse of China is not limited to the Communist Party of China. It was shared, for example, by Chiang Kai-shek and previous regimes in China's history. These territories also possess, these territories meaning Xinjiang and Tibet, also possess enormously important additionalities from the connectivity, developmental, and, and water resources, especially in respect to Tibet perspectives. This is a huge subject in itself, and I will not go into it. The impact of the above was in clear evidence post India's independence in August 47 and the CPC victory in October 1949 in China. The Mao regime moved swiftly into Xinjiang and Tibet and thereafter to establish its frontiers in the South Asia region. It started with the agreement with India on trade with Tibet in 1954. There followed boundary agreements with Burma 1960, Nepal 1960 and 61, Pakistan 1963 and Afghanistan November 1963. Please bear in mind that the agreements with Pakistan were over a border that was part of the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir that had been illegally occupied by Pakistan in late 1947. The rice rubber pact with Ceylon in 1952 falls into a different category, but was strategically important as will become clear in my presentation. The border with India that runs along Xinjiang and Tibet remains disputed. Underlying the early Chinese move into South Asia, was also the strategic concern over India, which had emerged as a plural and democratic country after independence, and whose voice was being heard with some attention and respect in other parts of Asia and Africa. In effect, India provided an ideological challenge and alternative model of governance. This is best explained, for instance, by Hu Shasheng and Wang Chui of the CC of, of Kekir, one of China's most influential foreign policy think tanks. In an article dated 28th October last year, they have written in detail on the behavioral logic behind India's tough foreign policy towards China. This article was written after China's unprovoked aggression in India against India in June 2020. And in violation of formal agreements to maintain peace and tranquility along the line of actual control in the India-China border areas. Hu and Wang postulate in their article that, and I quote, as one newborn state, namely China, is a denier, denier of the colonial order, while the other one, namely India, is its successor. China and India were doomed to have a serious collision of interests 
or even military conflict from the very beginning of their independence and since establishing frontier and regional order, unquote. They go on to add, more complicated than issues relating to their frontier is the struggle for order in the region involving relations among China, India, and their neighbors, which is mainly manifested as contention for influence and dominance. As I mentioned earlier, President Xi Jinping has made it clear that China will vie for influence in South Asia, of which it is the biggest neighbor. Hu and Wang also allege in their article that India is pursuing Monroeism in South Asia. Prime Minister Modi's policy of neighborhood first is projected as the BJP's era of Monroeism, which has collided with China's BRI. And hence, the authors conclude, and I quote, China and India have increasingly entered into an intensified contention in South Asia and the Northern Indian Ocean. I have no desire to comment on Hu and Wang's very far-fetched judgment. You will also notice now that the Indian Ocean has come into play in their calculation. The reference to the Indian Ocean is significant as China has grown to become the second largest economy in the world and a huge military power, it has begun to aggressively pursue its interests abroad. In the wake of the massive impact of the global financial crisis and the ongoing global COVID-19 pandemic, China has discovered fresh and wide, widely spread security interests all over the globe. This is a natural quality of China's aggressive approach in recent years, both regionally and internationally. It is also an outcome of the decision to define China's developmental interests, both internal and international, as a core concern and objective of China's foreign and security policies. In this latter context, the Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal, and the Arabian Sea have acquired huge importance for China. The problem is that India sits at the head of the Indian Ocean and borders both the Bay of Bengal and, and the Arabian Sea, and along with its partners, are determined to ensure that the Indian Ocean and Indian, and indeed the Indo-Pacific remain free, open, inclusive, and rules-based spaces underlined by respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty, etc. They're also committed to peaceful resolution of disputes in accordance with international law, including UNCLOS. Strangely, these criteria seem to be an anathema to China, which brooks no interference in its self-determined and self-justified claims to territory, developmental interests, norms of behavior, and unilateral interpretation of trade, investment, and connectivity rules of the game. India's historical maritime outreach is well-defined. Its symbols stand out in Southeast Asia, West Asia, and further afield. India's colonial rulers had also fully understood the importance of India in their maritime and overall, overall strategy, East and West of Aden. Curzon had recognized and understood what India's ancient rulers, such as the Cholas, knew. In an opinion article by A. West Michel in the Hindustan Times that appeared on 13th June this month, the author argues that, quote, India's security and greatness were ultimately tied to the maritime routes and choke points connecting it to Europe and the Far East. Lose control of those and India would be hostage to its strongest landward neighbor. Michel, incidentally, is a former US Assistant Secretary of State. China is highly dependent for its future progress and prosperity on access to overseas markets, technology, investment, raw materials, etc. Hence, it seeks domination and control, not only of seas in its periphery and beyond in the Pacific, but also in the Indian Ocean and its adjacent, adjacent seas. It has thus been extending its geopolitical and geostrategic rivalry with India and South Asia to the Indian Ocean region. It wishes to be able to permanently break out of the first and second island chains that shackle it on its east and southeast coasts. It has no other access to the seas, and as mentioned earlier, is highly dependent on the world to sustain its economic growth and its objective of regaining its old historical status of being the largest economy in the world, it also seeks to become the number one global power. The several connectivity initiatives announced by President Xi over the last eight years, such as the BRI, etc., are intended to achieve this objective and create a new geostrategic cosmos with China at the hub. It is also intended to thwart attempts to exclude it from existing emerging arrangements in its periphery. I might add this initiative has been long in the making. China's creation of geopolitical rivalry in South Asia essentially hinges on two main prongs over and above an unrelenting demand for reasons identified earlier to settle the border with India and Bhutan on its own self-defined terms. The first prong is to draw India's neighbors out of India's sphere of influence by a variety of means, notwithstanding their historical and civilizational linkages and relationships. 
This effort has been happening for over 70 years now. The latest manifestation is the BRI and the CPEC type processes. The second prong came into effective play only after China began developing huge naval assets to be able to break out of the US imposed shackles in the Western Pacific and become an effective naval power in its adjacent seas and thereafter look to the Indian Ocean region. This strategy actually was spent out, spelled out as early as December 2006 by then President Hu Jintao. And if you'll recall that China's white paper on national defense in 2008 defined the PLA Navy as a strategic service for the PLA and its tasks included safeguarding China's maritime rights and interests. Since then, China has virtually convert, converted the South China Sea region into a Chinese lake and simultaneously made forays in the Indian Ocean region. The anti-piracy operations of Aden provided a convenient pretext for the latter. Then came the acquisition of bases and potential bases. The world, however, is no longer just waiting and watching. Serious countermeasures and arrangements are now in the making. The problem for China is that its creation of geopolitical rivalry in South Asia and through its various connectivity projects in the region and beyond under the rubric of BRI is now being seriously challenged both individually and by like-minded countries. The pushback is not only in the Indian Ocean and the Indo-Pacific regions. This has been, become clear from the outcomes of the recently concluded G7, NATO and EU, EU US summits earlier this month. I'll conclude very briefly, Mr. Panda, if you will give me one more minute. The present Chinese leadership has since 2013 spoken of the objective of working towards building a community of common destiny for mankind. You will recall that in, in, in March 2015, President Xi Jinping had spoken at the Boa Forum on a new future for Asia. He spoke then of an Asian way without being too specific about what that was. But the underlying focus was on linkages being established by Asian countries with China. It was suggested that this trend be accentuated. Mr. Xi Jinping specified that the interests of Asian countries have become intertwined and a community of common destiny has increasingly taken shape. He also warned, however, that Asia still faces numerous challenges and old issues left over from history and new ones associated with current disputes. With hindsight, one can arguably state that South Asia is certainly a challenge for China. India's unwillingness to sign on to the BRI and rejection of the CPEC and other similar Chinese proposals on wholly justifiable grounds has clearly added, added to China's discomfiture. It has also accentuated the geopolitical and strategic rivalry created by China in South Asia. It is for China to decide to what extent it wishes to pursue its geopolitical rivalry with India and South Asia. Its actions and policies have so far not provided it with any real material gain. It has to understand that India too has its non-negotiable core concerns in South Asia, as well as in the broader Indo-Pacific. More importantly, it has the determination and means to safeguard its core interests. Thank you for your patience. And I apologize, Mr. Chairman, for having exceeded my time. Not a problem. Uh, it was an excellent uh, thoughts by you, sir, uh, Ambassador Suri. In fact, uh, I'll leave most part of your speech for the discussion, uh, but one point I would like to mention right away that uh, when you said that India provided ideological uh, challenge to China. So that means uh, with regard to this session, one can uh, really come <coughs> to this uh, line by saying that uh, there are more, more uh, geopolitical issues, beyond geopolitical issues. Uh, uh, issues are there so complicated historically that we cannot really just say that uh, connectivity, geopolitics, economics, and resources are the prime drivers of uh, uh, China's rivalry with the neighboring countries. When it comes to India, there are more to it. Uh, with this note, uh, maybe I would request uh, the next speaker, that, uh, that is Dr. Than Hail to, uh, to begin his speech. And I would uh, essentially request him to keep it short, maybe seven to eight minutes, so that we can uh, left with some dis uh, you know, time for discussion. Over to you, Dr. Thor. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Uh, Jagannath Panda, uh, for giving the floor. And also, I would like to echo. Ambassador Suri to thank uh, uh, NIICE Global uh, and also Professor Pamot Jaswan for inviting me for the sessions. I think that uh, Ambassador Suri had set an excellent stage for the subsequent debate on the questions of China rise and also the geopolitical uh, rivalry. Uh, and uh, based on that, I also want to make a couple of uh, issues. I think that uh, the topic is very important 
because historically, uh, ubiquitous rivalry is actually a very uh, natural phenomenon of the great power politics associated with the rise of one power uh, that seeking for greater influence at the expense of others. So in the past, most of the case uh, uh, resulted into wars, and uh, of course that is definitely one of the uh, dominant features of the uh, uh, current politics, so that requires the attention of all of us. And of course, I'm, uh, I also mentioned that I try to speak from uh, my, my personal observations uh, as a scholar rather than, you know, as a, a diplomat. So definitely, it based on my longstanding uh, studies of uh, China's behavior, also interactions with the neighboring countries and also other great powers as well. And I try to make it short and in a couple of points, I mean, about uh, six or seven points, but very short. Uh, first one, I think, the, uh, I think the new round of intense uh, geopolitical contestations is triggered by the China rise. And of course, it's not uh, only starting with the President Xi Jinping, but as I observed from the Vietnam uh, experience that uh, we also see that uh, a lot of conditions, a lot of elements have been prepared in the previous one, especially China uh, heavy investment in the naval modernizations and also other types of power that would, you know, help China to expand further, uh, especially that uh, China had changed its uh, policy toward a greater assertiveness, I mean, at least, you know, since uh, 2009, when we see that it's a more and more wave of uh, assertive uh, behavior to try to control that uh, strategic waterways. And of course, I think that it's not only the South China Sea, we see also the increased tensions uh, around the uh, China neighborhood, even in the uh, South China Sea, East China Sea, and recently we see uh, the rising tensions in Taiwan Strait and in the Pacific Ocean, in the uh, greater presence of China is the Indian Oceans, and also got the, the rising concerns in the Himalaya regions. And of course, uh, I think that is not just about the, for the geopolitical control of the choke points, but uh, more or less also try to expand the sphere of influence or one way or another. And if we observe uh, the, you know, the China method, it's, it's more subtle and, uh, and more sophisticated than uh, just on the gunboat diplomacy. We have observed that the Chinas have deployed a combinations of different types of uh, influence from military, law enforcement, economic inducements, and also propagandas, and in many ways try to uh, seek greater influence in the regions. So what is behind the China uh, expansion in the regions? Uh, and I observe that it's not only about, I mean, the, the first and foremost about the control of access to natural resources in many ways and others, of uh, course, not only in the sea, but different areas in the Africa and other part, but also that uh, it's a natural for China with you know with the uh, portion of trade try to uh, secure the ceiling of communication for on type of, that type of uh, uh, transportations of the resources to China. Of course, it's also the uh, definitely the uh, last last thing that you know that is very important for China is also the political influences in many country. And the way China is, they try to uh, use the rules and divide by, in, I mean, first, I mean, the ultimate goal is try to expel the existing influence of the uh, US, Japan, and also the other power. With that China one, you know, have the dominant part in the history is a more the tributary system that, you know, China, uh, uh, that China worked with for many part of the decades. So that uh, the China expansions and also the assertiveness had triggered uh, competitions among uh, the great power. I think that definitely we see the, the, the size of uh, alignments and realignments of regions with the, I think the increasing pressure for the middle and small powers uh, to take size. Of course, it's not, you know, the, that kind of alliance system, but I think that in different fields, for example, the, the high tech and also, you know, for other field that we see that the small power um, by one way or another have to choose side. 
but I think that the very different with the, the uh, geopolitical now, different from the past, because you know there are very substantive uh, economic interdependence. Uh, I think that it will definitely com uh, uh, complicate you know the the rivalry. We don't see you know the decoupling that exists for uh, uh, in uh, expansively, but also that there's a, just a competitions and also even rivalry in the different type of sectors. So we see that the mix between interdependence and also the rivalry, and so some sense of trying to decouple one from the others, but we're not sure that you know that kind of uh, trend is success. So is a uh, the the nexus between the economic and security is become very uh, complex, and it's not very easy one for one another you know, to take size or maybe to take a different system. But I have to add, emphasize that although we haven't seen the big conflict and security uh, competition happen, but the risk of uh, militarism is greater. And we will see some size of you know, increased uh, military maneuver, especially in the naval and air fields. Within the Taiwan Strait in South China Sea, we see different types of gunboats uh, in, 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 on the rise. And also the country are uh, invested more heavily in uh, arms build up. Was uh, it very premature to talk about arm race, but definitely I think that trend is growing and intensifying going on. And on the uh, final note, I have to also highlight the case that we have, you know, the middle and small power uh, now in uh, in the better positions and have been given with the role uh, to build up. Uh, to develop a new system and to block the ground for new type of competitions. I think that it's better for US and China to compete with each other. It's not on geopolitical term, but try to promote uh, and provide with the public goods so that you know uh, who will decide the rule is will contribute, uh, contribute to the with the, uh, the consolidation data peace and stability in the region rather than you know the political control of that. On that note, I would like to end my uh, my presentation here and uh, looking for the, any questions and comments on the ground. Thanks a lot. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, so, um, I, in fact, uh, I could see that your presentation seems to indicate that uh, probably there are no better regions uh, for China to implement a policy of divide and rule um, than Southeast Asia. So that's a point. <laughs> For our discussion, um, without uh, really waiting, let me let me invite uh, Dr. Nicholas Swinston uh, to share his point of view about uh, China and the geopolitical rivalry in the regions, and how <clears throat> probably Europe and the greater part of uh, the Europe, that is the Nordic regions, is looking at China. Um, over to you, Dr. Swinston. Well, thank you, Dr. Panda. Uh, I would also extend my thanks to Pramod Jaswal and and, and Nice to organize this very nice event. Um, well, actually, it, 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 when you, Dr. Panna, when you say uh, there's no better region than uh, uh, the Asian region to create uh, divide and rule, I mean, Europe might actually be one of these regions that it actually, China has been very successful in doing. Um, but let me take one step back. I mean, the title of this, this session can be almost a misnomer. I mean, maybe it would be better to see China as the accelerator of geopolitical rivalry. And I'm not blaming China for geopolitics um, and, and all of this. I mean, geopolitical struggle is a part of international politics. Uh, there's no, of course, no single reason for geopolitical rivalry. Um, equally, it's in the interest of free trade nations and democracies to decrease or slow down China's influence. But I think that China has been accelerating a lot of geopolitical struggle. And I come back, I don't think it's only about geopolitics, it's also it's about ideology and geoeconomics, if you, if you want to use that. But what we've seen from China is an extremely um, aggressive um, behavior. Uh, that has resulted in a very strong backlash from the international community. And I think that this has been a, a much stronger backlash than China has actually imagined. Um, I don't think that, uh, and I did not think that the international community would actually be able to push back China. 
but we also see a reformulation of China's strategy now. Um, not the end goal, but it's uh, a way forward. And, and I, th I think in Europe, not least, we see that, that China has been very quiet the last few months. Um, the wolf warrior diplomacy that um, Xi Jinping initiated has actually been a bit more silent. Um, I mean, China's arrogance has been growing and uh, as Xi Jinping pointed out in 2017, it's time for us to take the center stage in the center stage in the world. I don't even agree, uh, sorry, I don't disagree that China deserves a center position in international politics, but I think it's much more how do you do it? I mean, it's been a shine on steroids with the true uh, the BRI, um, but I I do see that um, um, China's also used its economic muscles to influence and exert pressure on a number of uh, smaller states. Um, I mean, Sweden we being one of these cases where we try to push back China's negative influence, and the reaction has been very tough. Australia as being another one, just to mention two countries um, in the, call it the Western Hemisphere. Um, but China has been, I think it's been extremely successful in salami slicing the international community. Um, there's been a, a case of a Chinese tango, where the Chinese uh, politics takes two steps forward and one step back, and then they claim that they have been uh, compromising. Uh, I think we're going to see the same thing in Nepal, in uh, Vigu in, uh, or Hamla or other places where China has pushed its border demarcations forward. It probably will um, compromise, but it will compromise in the sense that it has gained uh, uh, sort of turf. The same we see with Japan and the Senkaku Jiayu Islands, but the same we see also in business sector in, in, uh, in Sweden and in, in Europe. Um, and I think it's been very clear how China is trying to use this, its muscles. And I'm just going to take Sweden as one example here with the 5G case where China is um, extremely concerned that we're leaving out um, Huawei out of the bidding. But at the same time, I think we should realize that there's no foreign companies in the Chinese 5G system. So they have this dual system of having access internationally, but refusing access internally. And I'm not actually criticizing China for defending its own domestic system. I think we should all do that. Um, I, I do see the, the, the limitations of allowing um, um, foreign companies into uh, domestic sensitive systems. But reaction towards Sweden and Europe is very tough. And now we, we see a lot of sanctions on people. We see um, uh, quite high number of people being blacklisted, not only member of national par parliaments, research, the think tanks, um, or for that matter, kidnapping of citizens. But we also see blacklisting of committees of the European Parliament, the European Council. Um, and I, of course, think it's the Europeans have stepped up its game. Uh, it's, they tried to push back, and I think it's necessary to put, not to back down and push further back. But um, it is uh, a lot of interference in internal affairs now by China in Europe and internationally. And I think COVID-19, and we can talk about that, has, has um, created a bit more pressure. This has resulted in a number of things that I think we, we need to look at. And the maritime ambitions has been talked about. I, I would like also to, the Coast Guard law in 2021 is one of the case, Taiwan, but also the supply chains. What we've seen that China controls 28% of the global supply chains. What we're going to see, and they, they control a large part of rare earth minerals. What we're going to see now is in the creation of alternatives. We're going to see a reaction where international business is moving away from China out of necessity. 
And, um, and I think that this is sort of the, the reaction with China's taking it one step too far. And the Quad is one of these cases. NATO could be one of these cases. G7 definitely was one of them. Um, and regional states are concerned. But I think the strength of China is not necessarily China itself, but it's rather how the West and of course United States primarily, but also European Union has failed to offer alternatives. I mean, we have a red supply lane, a supply chain, but we don't really have an alternative to the Chinese supply. So, I mean, it's not only that we need, uh, you know, we cannot only criticize China uh, from, from the outside, we need also to criticize ourselves um, because um, if India, for example, um, Europe, United States, Japan, whatever you take, large economies, uh, should be enough, uh, um, an alternative, we have to offer credible alternatives. So sure, I mean, I'm, I'm critical of China, but I'm also critical of our, our own game. But this is politics in all honor, but this is also an ideological confrontation. But not only, I mean, I think what came out here was also that India and China has an ideological clash. I think that is very much true. But at the same time, even if you pick out ideology out of India and China, you still have a border conflict. So this is the, the ideology, the uh, politics, and also the economy. Those three factors interact very significantly, and that accelerates it. What are we, what's going to happen then? Well, China's here to stay. And I think that China should remain one of the major actors in international states. But according to me, it's taken the wrong turn. The communist part of China has really turned into much more certain aggressive um, um, actor. It's taken a much more anti-democratic direction, direction. And I think that that's going to create a long-term geopolitical struggle that is here to stay. And I, with that, I see that Dr. Panda looks worried, so I will end here. And I'm happy for, I've been rushing through a presentation of six hours. <laughs> but um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swanson. In fact, uh, those are uh, insightful thoughts. Um, in fact, two points I'll make uh, from your pre presentation. I mean, um, one is that, of course, uh, as we all probably would agree, that probably whether it is right or wrong, uh, we can decide later. We cannot probably um, say that China is the creator of all the rivalry or the tensions in the regions. But as you rightly pointed out, the Chinese behavior and the Chinese action plan has definitely accelerated some of these tensions and rivalry in the region. So in a way, we can say that China is an accelerator uh, when it comes to the geopolitical rivalry. The second is that from your presentation, I think one thing which is coming out very clearly, and here I, I would probably make uh, a point uh, on the basis of concession, um, consensus, on the basis of the three presentation that has been made so far, that what is appearing very clearly, that it's not only the lower index, indexed countries or lower income countries or emerging economies, emer developing societies that are are you know um, currently living with a rival context with China, but I think the highly developed countries, including Sweden, and as you rightly pointed out, Sweden actually leads the example among the European countries to have a very tough uh, relationship with China. So the highly developed index countries also having the similar uh, problems uh, in in tackling the Chinese behavior and uh, relationship with China. So with this note, maybe uh, uh, let me invite the, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Um, Chopin, uh, the director of the Institute of China Studies, uh, University of M Malaya. Um, his profile and the publications are easily available in the website, but uh, let me invite him to share his thoughts, um, probably to have a Malaysian perspective on China and the geopolitics. Over to you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairperson, uh, Dr. Uh, Jagan Panda. I uh, haven't seen you for a while and good to see you here. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. Last time I really was excited to go to India, but yeah, things didn't work out. But uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer, uh, Nepal 
Institute of International uh, Cooperation and Engagement uh, for inviting me, especially Dr. Pramod. Now, uh, it has been a privilege uh, to attend this session uh, along with other distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, I have a PowerPoint to share. Um, so I'm going to, uh, may I know, is it showing? Yes. Yes, all right, great, thank you. Uh, so, um, all right, so uh, I will, <laughs> this is actually a, still a very undeveloped, not fully developed, not fully mature train of thoughts. Uh, I have been, uh, I want to talk a bit something more uh, abstract in a sense of uh, what the Chinese vision of the world, at least at the current moment, uh, is all about. And of course, the way that they implement it or the one of the one of the main ways of implementing it would be the, the BRI and what is this uh, ultimate end vision of the BRI is supposed to be uh, and then how is it uh, going to be very different from the liberal international order you no know, this is kind of the major uh, conception of how the world more or less has been operating uh, until the rise of China uh, of course before we also have the Soviet Union offering alternative but more or less the international liberal the liberal order has been known as the uh, the mainstream kind of uh, order uh, so uh, I want to just offer kind of this uh, still developing thoughts uh, sharing with the audience and the fellow panelists here um, and I BRI, of course, is the major story uh, in the past seven or eight years uh, since China announced it. And because China really has gone on to uh, uh, initiate many infrastructure projects, gigantic infrastructure, uh, infrastructure projects uh, across Eurasia, Africa, and uh, in actually beyond Eurasia in some other parts of the world. Uh, of course, uh, creating uh, huge controversies here and there, but also undeniably also increasing uh, connectivities and uh, uh, also increasing China's uh, profiles and influence in many parts of the world. Uh, and Beijing, of course, couch uh, the BRI as it's the public goods contributions uh, to the, especially to the developing world. It's not confined to the developing world, but it's uh, more uh, tied to the way of, of uh, China offering a solution, the so-called China solution. Uh, to the persistent issue of underdevelopment uh, in many parts of the developing world, uh, fostering connectivities uh, and economic partnerships and therefore unlocking flows of uh, people, trade, goods, investment, and so on and so forth. And this is how you know, China uh, generally wants to present its BRI and ultimately lead to what is called as community of common or shared destiny. I think uh, the previous speakers have touched upon a little bit about it. And there's no question that uh, the, the end, uh, I mean, the, the, the realization of this community the, will, of course, be the leadership position of Beijing being significantly enhanced, enhanced and, uh, uh, in, in the world. Um, from the perspective of the liberal order, there are a number of uh, issues, concerns, challenges, and usually it is couched in a way that the BRI is a significant challenge to the existing order. Uh, first of all, China is led by a very authoritarian regime. Uh, well, it was already authoritarian, but becoming more and more authoritarian under Xi Jinping. Uh, and that enough. that is enough of a major worry. Uh, and then, of course, there are many uh, values, rights, standards, and principles that are emphasized by the liberal uh, order that are not being emphasized by the BRI, right? And in a lot of the, especially some of the foreign media's uh, understanding and also some of the local oppositions to the BRI, number of issues, including that it in, enables uh, corruption uh, and the survival of some of the unpopular uh, political elites, uh, contributions to uh, environmental destructions and the or the destruction of the local communities because the, the standards are not high. It's a low standards uh, kind of the projects uh, undermines democratic values and uh, national sovereignty. The idea of debt trap uh, has been uh, well, uh, uh, well talked talk about right, uh, in, uh, in many circles. Um, and the general, uh, this very liberal kind of uh, view of the BI is that this is a promoter of a liberal, illiberal order, uh, supporting authoritarian regimes, uh, exporting uh, its own values, 
making the world safe for autocracy is one way of putting it globalized authoritarianism or remaking the world in china's own image these are some of the uh the phrases that i capture uh that talk about how the bii is fundamentally a, a way for china to uh, create an illiberal order a kind of a dystopia uh, in the in the in the future um in particular, I think uh, one dimension of the BR is the digital Silk Road. I think uh, the previous panelists talked about you know, Huawei and all these uh, telecommunications uh, infrastructure uh, building. And there is a, a deep worry that uh, China is exporting its digital authoritarianism uh, to other countries. Uh, so and create, creating this digital dystopia, so to speak. Um, and the uh, defenders of the liberal order are coming up with a number of uh, initiatives and alternatives uh, from Blue Dot Network uh, to Quality Infrastructure Partnership, uh, Free and Open Indo-Pacific. And the latest is the uh, Build Back Better World, right? just announced a couple of weeks ago uh, during the G7 summit. So there are serious efforts to catch up with China's uh, BRI vision, wanting to offer uh, the uh, uh, the alternatives and wanting to pre uh, preserve the liberal order against this uh, BRI as an illiberal order building uh, 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 kind of the tools right to, to build this illiberal order. I'm sorry. Um, so, however, I I I think there is uh, one way of thinking it, but uh, I will say that the BRI may not necessarily be an illiberal order. I think what China has in mind is an illiberal order. Uh, because when we think about liberal order, sometimes we think that too much of the existing institutions or too much of the existing sort of rule of the games are liberal. But I would say that some of them are actually not necessarily liberal, it's just illiberal. Right. Uh, I give some examples. Uh, AIIB, of course, is offered by China, uh, but uh, could we say that because it is offered by China, therefore it's an illiberal? The way that I look at AIIB, the way that it functions, it operates, uh, is nothing quite illiberal other than it, China being the largest shareholder of AIIB and is being headquartered in Beijing. Um, I think uh, India is a and many European countries, uh, many liberal countries uh, contribute to it, it's part of it. And so far, I don't think it has engaged in a lot, many you know, uh, controversial issues. Is it liberal or illiberal or a illiberal country, China taking, joining a liberal uh, game? Or look at ASEAN. I have, we have some fellow panelists from ASEAN and uh, please disagree with me if you uh, feel uh, dis uh, disagreeable. But I, my belief and the way that I look at ASEAN, the way that I grew up in this region, I think ASEAN is a liberal, is not liberal or not illiberal in a sense. Uh, we, the ASEAN has accommodated a number of illiberal regimes, and for and for long years, long time, right? It hasn't really talked about liberal as the very core uh, part of regional order building. It doesn't dismiss it but it's not the only one. Uh, I think the major characteristics of ASEAN is a liberal. And this is how I would say that China's BRI is not necessarily about building an illiberal world order, it's about building an a liberal. is trying to de-emphasize the liberal elements of it, but it's not necessarily trying to fill in the illiberal elements uh, into it. Uh, I, this is actually uh, how Chinese government own uh, perception of it, but in this case, I would agree. You know, Foreign Minister Wang Yi saying that they are uh, insist on open tolerance, and you know, of course, this is a very sunny way of putting it. But I do think that the the thought, the the idea that different system and civilization are accommodated within this BRI, um, there is no ideological bias, uh, is at least partly true. Uh, so this is the headline that you know from SCMP talking about China Bell and not ideological. Uh, actually, I do believe that this is actually not very ideological because there is no, no core advantage for China to make it ideological uh, rather than make it non-ideological. So I would say that the BRI, we have to look at it as beyond liberal and illiberal dichotomy. 
uh, liberal values, I think, are purposely not defined as a dividing line because it would not be an advantage to China to define it in the way. But it would be actually an advantage for the adversaries of China to define it in that way because it will enhance their solidarity and uh, coherence. Uh, but it will not be the way for China to do, to do it that way. Uh, so I think what we are seeing is a contention not between liberal and illiberal order, but it's a contention between liberal and a-liberal order. This is just a very preliminary element. I think there are many things that can be further, uh, further uh, refined, uh, better refined or further crystallized. But I think the value basis of liberal order, I think is very clear, is liberal values. Uh, and liberal values generally believe as universal values and very thick conception. For a liberal, I, again, I have to answer that a liberal doesn't dismiss liberal, but it just doesn't take liberal values as the one and only and most important priority core areas. It will be just one among a number of other values, economic development being one of those. And then it will emphasize a lot more on universal interests rather than universal values. And the way they discuss or conceptualize values is thin rather than thick. Uh, for economic elements, uh, the liberal will talk, of course, emphasize free trade, uh, plus a lot more at the moment, increasingly more about no labor rights, intellectual property protection. protection. But for a liberal, it really depends. It doesn't have a singular conception of what are the economic elements of the, of the a liberal international order. And for security, it's about collective security alliance system. Uh, for the a liberal will be more on the non-alliance partnership common security talking about you no know, trying to um, trying not to uh, create the kind of a uh, block versus block kind of uh, of a security uh, dynamics uh, in the in the global system and the multilateral foundations will be very much like mindedness coming together uh, but for a liberal I think uh, for lack of a better term, of course, harmonious one is a Chinese official term, but I think it does convey what a liberal world order is. That it does, we don't have to be like-minded, but we have to manage the differences uh, in, a, in a way that, 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 uh, prop, that sustain the, the foundation of multilateral uh, engagement. And in a way, ASEAN way uh, is one manifestation of this kind of a liberal multilateral foundation. All right, so that is uh, my, uh, uh, my thought about this uh, China's vision of the world, and I welcome any comments and questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Uh, I think, um, a very thoughtful presentation. In fact, uh, one point uh, that will go probably for further discussion is that uh, uh, when you talked about you know, liberal and illiberal uh, uh, contest that is emerging in the regions, many countries in the regions probably has to clarify their position or at least take a specific position. There are many countries like India, Australia, who are actually part of the emerging narrative of Indo-Pacific, but they are the part of the AIIB process where BRI is also an integral part uh, and the way the Chinese are actually flooding the BRI projects through AIIB, that is a worrisome factor for the regions. And probably countries like India and Australia has to revisit their approach and uh, positions with regard to AI. Uh, so with that thought, let me invite the next speaker, uh, Professor um, uh, uh, Goran Ilik. He is the Dean Faculty of Law from University of Bitola. Uh, he is going to speak to us um, on uh, probably an end to European novel, uh, the EU coherence and the challenges of the Chinese global new functionalism. Uh, over to you, Professor um, uh, Ilik. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to NICE for inviting me for this great uh, scientific event, especially to my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Pram of the Jaisval. Uh, let's begin. Uh, the neo-functionalism is a theoretical approach that focuses primarily on the European integration process, but some of its concepts are very useful to deconstruct the new EU-China context regarding the Chinese strategic approach towards Europe. Spillover is the neo-functionalism most famous element. According to the author Leon Lindbergh, spillover refers to a situation in which a given action related to a specific goal just the first condition and need for more action and so forth. 
the spillover represents the effect uh, from the ongoing process of integration and specific integration in certain sectors and areas that spontaneously leads to integration in another sector or area or achieving the integration in one sector leads to a spillover effect into other policy areas as the father of the European Union, Jean Monnet, once acknowledged. Uh, the author Ernst Haas argued that activities associated with sectors integrated initially would spill over into neighboring sectors not yet integrated, but how becoming the focus of demands for more integration. Therefore, the three types of spillover effects have generally been identified. At first, the functional, the second, political, and the third, cultivated type of spillover effect. To say immediately that China's main objective is not to provoke any regional integration in Europe, but to create uh, a network of interests through economic assets in certain areas with particular countries in Europe, predominantly on a bilateral level, aiming to impose its political influence on Europe as a whole. China tendencies to create a base for triggering spillover effects in other areas, such as banking, research, transport, culture, education, under the uh, BRY framework. In this way, Spontaneously, China tends to provide for itself a fertile ground for future action and the possibility of blackmailing Europe and the European Union as well, if necessary to meet its global ambitions and goals. Uh, this is still known as debt trap diplomacy, uh, which implies that a creditor country intentionally lends excessive credit to a smaller debtor country with the intention of extracting economic or political concession, concessions when the smaller country cannot service the loan. On that basis, 17 plus 1 framework appears very malleable spillover trigger directed towards Europe and the EU as well. The 17 plus 1 framework meets annually on summit level with 17 national coordinators in each of the partner Central European countries, which are Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Croatia, Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Macedonia, Montenegro, Poland, Romania, Serbia, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Greece as well. China developed this framework to improve and to extend cooperation in the field of trade, banking, research, transport, etc., with 11 EU member states and six countries in the Balkans. Today, this framework became the most significant forum for Belt and Road initiatives promotion in Europe. It is very obvious that through this framework, China is trying to enter the back door in Europe using the naivety of its member states and their desire for rapid and cheap investments. Despite that, there are European countries that clearly and openly express their political support for Chinese behavior. Hungary is one of them. At Dubrovnik summit in Croatia in April uh, 2019, Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, did not miss to emphasize that, opening quote, Hungary is willing to continue deepening practical bilateral cooperation with China, accelerate the implementation of the Hungarian section of the Belgrade Budapest Railway, and enhance cooperation in areas including agriculture and tourism. Due to this intensive bilateralism, the EU should definitely build its own system of protection as would have preserved its founding values and its existence in the new international context. The European Union needs to build its protective shields, with which should cover a set of instruments and relationships that hinder or disrupt Chinese negative influence on Europe, on the European Union, and on its member states. 
of course, it, it, uh, it should not be a protective rampart or some uh, impenetrable wall, which, to be honest, is still in its rudimentary phase and yet to be developed. China is a rising global power, so it is high time for the European Union to properly prepare and position itself for this emerging power until it is too late. In that sense, I have identified two types of protection from Chinese negative spillover triggers for the European Union. The first one is formal and the second one is informal type of protection. Within the formal type of protection as the most serious but not the most effective, can be specified the European Union's regulation for establishing a framework for the screening of uh, FDIs into the Union. Responding to increased levels of foreign direct investments in sensitive sectors, especially by China, the European Union Parliament approved this investment screening framework in order to pay attention to the investments that are strange, that do not make economic sense, but are predominantly political. But do not expect too much from this regulation. This screening framework predominantly represents a coordination and cooperation tool of the European member states. The screening procedure encourages investment scrutiny based on three criteria that have the potential to affect security or public order as a regulation uh, First of all, uh, investments in sectors identified as critical and sensitive. The second one, investments as part of state-led outward projects, but I can say here investments made by either private or public companies that have direct or indirect state support as part of an overall agenda, something like Costco company in, yeah, uh, in Athens, Greece. And the first, uh, the first is investments by state control entities. Uh, so the screening process is defined or can be defined as procedure allowing to assess, investigate, authorize, condition, or for a large amount of FDI that the policy covers, the impact of this on Chinese FDI levels will be because transactions will be blocked at the level. Regulation is clear on this issue, stating in Article 1 that nothing in this regulation shall limit the right member state site whether or not to screen a particular foreign direct investment within the framework of this regulation. Nevertheless, EU-wide screening regime is an achievement of EU unity. But as far as the informal types of protection, uh, the EU should reaffirm its founding constitutional values in order to use their integrative power and to raise awareness between the member states about the importance of unity within the EU. In this context, a problem would arise with several states, notably Hungary, Hello? 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 Can't hear him. <clears throat> Dr. Elik, we can't hear you. I think he ran into a problem, internet problem. Uh, Dr. Elik, are you there? Dr. Elik, are you there? No, I think he's having a connection problem. Uh, so what I would encourage, what I would do is that maybe I would invite, uh, without wasting time, I would invite the next speaker, uh, Dr. Romel Banloi, uh, 
to share his observation. He is the president of Philippines Association for China Studies. And then we'll uh, maybe see whether we can get back to the Professor Ilik uh, later on to finish. And I would like to thank my professor uh, Pramud for the kind invitation and all people of the NICE for uh, inviting me again. Dr. Baloy, uh, Dr. Baloy yes. uh, may I request yes. you just to stop here because I think we just got uh, back. Uh, uh, oh, that's okay. Ilik. Yeah, Professor Ilik is here. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry the connection was interrupted. Not a problem, it happens. Please go ahead. Yes, of course, I will uh, be short. Uh, so I, I think that I mentioned that the European Union has taken proactive measures in, measures in managing the member states in order to achieve consensus and coherence on the most important strategic issues of the European Union's interest. Based on that, I can conclude that the European Union faces a serious challenge from China. China is increasingly buying the world with its investments, providing fertile, fertile ground for its own political influence, for the use of debt trap diplomacy, corruption and blackmailing. This mode of action of China is based on a predatory and assertive type of neo-functionalism, which through the Belt and Road Initiative and 70 plus one framework as spillover triggers, aims at achieving its own political global goals. In addition to all of uh, disadvantages, the European Union's foreign policy, the intense excessive bilateralism that certain EU member states, especially Hungary, as I said before, affirm in their relations with China is an additional aggravating circumstances for Europe. This is also seen through the adoption of the FDI screening regulation, which does not establish a centralized system of protection, but rather a coordination mechanism left in the hands of the EU member states. This regulation should be treated only as a beginning of a long and painful EU reform process. Additionally, the coherence of the European Union uh, regarding to China is also in the hands of the EU elite, in particular the President of the European Council and, its, and the High Representative. And also they are the ones who should take a proactive approach in combating, uh, combating harmful bilateralism of the EU member states and China. So, at the end, does Europe naivety end? Of course, yes. And it is time for the Union to begin remodeling its system in a more supranational and federal direction, fully adhering to its founding values. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can you hear me, Dr. Banloi? Please go ahead and make your presentation. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Can you now see my uh, slide? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is the beauty about uh, speaking uh, uh, on the last part because uh, many things have already been spoken. So I have the ability also to uh, opportunity to uh, revise my presentation. So what I would like to discuss now is to talk about the role of the Philippines in US-China rivalry. So uh, it is like a struggle between a close neighbor and a distant uh, relative. China is, uh, and the United States have always been uh, considered to be formidable factors in the formulation and implementation of Philippine foreign policy. Uh, as a close Asian neighbor, China's friendly relations with the Philippines date back many centuries ago, as early as the 19th, 19th century, in fact, even before the rise of Western colonial powers. And these long centuries of friendships resulted in China's deeply rooted economic, cultural, political influences on Philippine domestic politics and foreign relations. In fact, we had a national hero uh, with uh, uh, Chinese background, ethnic uh, identity, Jose Rizal, and uh, we had uh, two presidents with uh, Chinese ethnic origin. So uh, China's influence in Philippine foreign relations and domestic politics is considered to be very strong. The United States, on the other hand, 
has enormously left an indelible mark in Philippine cultural, economic, social, and political life, being an erstwhile colonial master for uh, uh, more than half a century. And Filipinos even describe Americans as distant relatives as a result of uh, these uh, strong colonial experiences. In the United States, in fact, uh, many Americans describe Filipinos as Americans' little brown brothers because of the way Filipinos embrace an American way of life. In fact, we are so proud that uh, uh, we are speaking uh, English like, like, like uh, the, 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 the Indians and the uh, and, uh, Nepalese and, uh, and uh, Pakistani because of our uh, colonial experiences. The Philippines and the United States have been formal security allies since the signing of the Mutual Defense Treaty in 1951. In fact, the U.S. recognizes the Philippines as its oldest security ally in Asia. So in the context of U.S.-China geopolitical rivalry, it is very difficult not to include in the equation the role of the Philippines. And even prior to that, uh, uh, alliance, the Philippines became a U.S. colony from 1898 to 1946. And as, as a former colonial master and a currently a former ally, there's no doubt that the United States is playing an enormous influence in shaping Philippine foreign relations. Well, there is no doubt that relations of the Philippines with China can be considered as centuries old. Their current formal ties only normalized in 19, 1975. From 1946 to 1974, the Philippines declared China as a threat because of ideological conflicts of the Cold War. At the time, the Philippines embraced the uh, American-style uh, democracy, and uh, we regarded China during the height of the Cold War as a serious security threat. But in 1975, they established their formal diplomatic relations, and since then, both countries cooperated in various areas of mutual interest. However, their diplomatic relations became sour in 1995 when China occupied Mischief Reap, which falls under the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. But the two countries declared in 2005 the golden age of their bilateral ties with their increased cooperation despite the South China Sea dispute during the time of former President Gloria Macapal Arroyo. However, they suffered another difficulties in their bilateral ties, and they uh, suffered the lowest moment of their bilateral relations in 2013 when the Philippines filed an international arbitration case uh, against China on the South China Sea as a result of the 2012 Scarborough Shoal standoff. And right now, China is uh, having effective occupation of the Scarborough Shoal that falls within uh, the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. And from 2013, China built seven artificial islands within the Philippines' uh, exclusive economic zone. But during the time of President uh, Rodrigo Duterte, the two countries uh, rejuvenated their bilateral ties and enjoyed new heights in their uh, bilateral relations in 2016 when the Philippines implemented a great paradigm shift to China. In 2018, both countries declared comprehensive strategic cooperation in the 21st century as a result of the visit of President Xi Jinping to Manila. The assumption into office in January, in January 2021 of President Joe Biden and the growing international activism of President Xi through the Belt and Road Initiative that uh, was discussed uh, already uh, earlier are arguably putting the Philippines in a tightrope. Biden wants to reassert U.S. Glo global leadership while she promotes his vision of new global governance. Okay. In his interim national security strategic guidance released in March 2021, Biden recognizes the U.S. growing rivalry not only with China, but also with Russia and other authoritarian states. Biden also laments that China's increased assertiveness with its growing power is creating new threats to U.S. global interests, and not only to the United States, but also its allies in the world. Thus, Biden urges its friends and allies, including the Philippines, to prevail in strategic competition with China. But she, on the other hand, continues to advocate an alternative global system based on his idea of community of shared future for mankind. In his remarks, in fact, at the study session of the Politburo of the Communist Party of China, uh, which, which is currently celebrating its centennial anniversary uh, next month, she urges his party leaders to make friends 
in order to present an image of a credible, lovable, and respectable China. So indeed, U.S.-China rivalry is hitting under the Biden and Xi leaderships. And amid this situation, the Philippines is applying the strategy of small states with great powers by promoting friendly relations with China, while at the same time maintaining security alliance with the United States. And by doing so, the Philippines, particularly under the current administration of President Duterte, has moved to active small state diplomacy for risking its security alliance with the U.S. through its appeasement policy towards China. So while the Duterte administration is promoting friendly relations with China, it is still continues to work closely with the United States on a number of significant security and economic issues. Though, though critical of U.S. military presence in the Philippines, the Duterte administration, in fact, is not hampering the United States to conduct freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea, particularly in waters that we call West Philippine Sea. So the Philippines has even facilitated entry of the United States troops in the West Philippine Sea during the Trump ad administration, and that continues uh, until the Biden administration. So apparently, the Philippines is playing both sides of the major power game to assert what uh, the Duterte administration would call an independent foreign policy. Okay. But uh, there are risks uh, in playing both sides of the major power game because China can question the sincerity of the Philippines for being friendly, considering that Malila continues to maintain its security alliance with the United States. But on the other hand, the United States can also question the loyalty of the Philippines in the alliance for being friendly with China. So it is this situation. My proposal is that uh, for the Philippines to uh, continuously apply what scholars in the international relations would call as hedging strategy, which is in fact being practiced by many other small states, and I think I think Nepal is also uh, applying it in the context of uh, of major power rivalry, and we use this hedging strategy in dealing with major powers involved in. Uh, a strategic competition. So hedging encourages small states to take two sides rather than choose from these sides. Small states hedge to compensate for their smallness and to overcome their lack of hard power in order to advance their national interest. And hedging has become the primary response of most states in the Indo-Pacific to address many strategic uncertainties unleashed by increasing competition between China and the United States on key regional security issues. So uh, my recommendation to the Philippine government, and this has been also my recommendation to future presidential aspirants in the Philippines because we're having an election in May 2022, that rather than being torn between a close neighbor and a distant relative, hedging strategy allows the Philippines to get the best of both worlds in the ongoing U.S.-China major power rivalry, not only in the, in the Indo-Pacific, but also in the entire world. So rather than choose, we need to get the best worlds of both major powers. With that note, thank you very much for your attention. Salamat po. Well, uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Van Loy. Um, let me compliment you and Professor Wilk uh, for sticking to the time and making those wonderful remarks. Um, in fact, uh, about Professor Wilk, um, I do have a comment that, uh, you know, um, we did recently saw that, uh, uh, you know, the Lithuania withdrawing from the 17 plus one framework. And uh, the reasons Lithuania cited is very interesting. That is, the withdrawal is based on the practical uh, purposes. Now, what those practical purposes are, and when Lithuania actually went ahead by saying liberation of the Chinese Party. Now, how do you see the Xi Jinping administration approaching the world politics, the regional politics from now on? Do you think there will be a moderation in the approach that China has been implementing all this while, particularly during the pandemic? Um, there is a revisit will happen to their aggressive posturing about their aggressive strategy they have implemented over the last couple of years. How do you see the party conclave happening next week or this week um, coming as a kind of a defining moment for Chinese politics and foreign policy? Uh, maybe I would invite uh, uh, in the same order, uh, Ambassador Suri first to comment 
and then we'll go in the same order to, um, as listed in the program. Ambassador Suri, sir, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Panda. I think uh, that's a very pertinent question. But let me first congratulate all my co-panelists for outstanding presentations. I think the choice of speakers by Dr. Jaiswal was really very good. And so far as the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party of China is concerned, I think there are several trends that are visible. Now the question is whether the parties will concretize these trends in a document or in a declaration, time will tell. <clears throat> but I think uh, one clear trend is the internally, the Chinese Communist Party is certainly going back to a lot of the ways of Mao Zedong. Uh, you notice a huge focus on redness. You notice a huge focus on Mao himself. You see a huge focus on recreating the old heroes and their struggles and their contributions to the Communist Party of China. You notice a definite playing down of the tongue shopping era. Uh, so that is insofar as the internal aspect is concerned. At the same time, the other aspect of the internal development that I think is extremely noteworthy is the very uh, authoritarian manner in which China is being run now. Uh, I think uh, having been a reasonably regular visitor to China, uh, it is actually now quite suffocating to go there. Uh, but, but having said that, I think uh, uh, we also have to bear in mind that the expenditure on internal security is now exceeds the announced budget of the Ministry of Defense of China. Uh, the uncertainties in Xinjiang, Tibet, and other internal parts of China continue. So I think the, the party constantly keeps saying, we have not done enough, but we work for the people, and yet you need to spend so much more on internal security, and yet you want to go back to the days of, of Mao Zedong. I think um, you have to ask the right questions. Um, but in the case of China, as you all know, those who study China, you never know what the answers are going to be. They have a habit of coming up with surprises. If you remember when Xi Jinping took power, the general consensus, particularly amongst Western China watchers, was that Hu Jintao was a non-entity controlled by others. But Xi Jinping is a man we can do business with. He's a, he's a man who has ideas who can propel not just China forward, but take the entire world forward. I think we've seen from what's happened in the last many years, including the presentations today, that, that may not have been the accurate assessment. But one thing is very clear. The Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping is determined, we may call it the Chinese dream, rejuvenation, whatever, is determined to be number one in the world again. Not just in terms of economic power, but also in terms of being the number one global power. Now, I think the economic power aspect is much easier. <clears throat> In terms of GDP, it will exceed the United States sooner rather than later. But to be the number one global power, I think, entails much, much, much more. And I think that is where the problem is going to lie. And I think that is where Chinese actions in the last decade plus, and I would put these ac actions actually starting during the Hu Jintao era in about 2005, 2006, these actions have gently, but now more firmly, set up barriers against Chinese pushing. And uh, so we have to see, but I think uh, the headwinds that China is going to face now are going to be much stronger. And I think if the Chinese are not careful, they may create in their own area in East Asia, a situation that could become very dangerous and very troublesome. Uh, I think, you know, what, what, whatever I have said does not take away from the successes that China has achieved not only in economic terms, but also in terms of its ability to expand its international footprint. But I think um, some of the paths that they have chosen may have been quite inappropriate. So for me, what is relevant between now and the, ne and the next party Congress in 2022 is whether they take steps to correct these mistakes that they have made or will hubris prevail? Thank you. Excellent remarks. I completely agree. In fact, uh, uh, if we may recall, uh, your point uh, is valid in that context about uh, 
the chinese are giving uh, you know a very good in giving surprises uh, 2014 india is hosting the chinese president xi jinping as the state guest and we are seeing the pla coming to chumar valley you know there is a stand up happening there so uh, yeah we we could only hope that uh, the situation will improve and the chinese would actually do a course correction but uh, with this remarks uh, dr to uh, hi to uh, um, how do you think uh, the uh, party 100 years of celebrations is going to um, impact the chinese whether they will review the situation uh, thank you dr panda i think it's very interesting questions to look at the, the milestone in the history of communist party but i think that is um, it more a symbolic and thing that would be happen if we look into the dynamics between the uh, Chinese Communist Party and so the is a uh, foreign uh, foreign policies. We think that would be you know uh, the the long uh, established tendency rather than you know a short term uh, uh, shift or any ways that we see the uh, I mean domestically we see the uh, consolidation of the one man. Uh, uh, leadership or maybe what uh, one man do in that and um, I increasingly see, see that the you know, with that type of system China uh, uh, it's very hard for China to review it uh, foreign policy it domestic and foreign policy so as the uh, ambassador Suri also questioned whether China have the capability to correct this it path I'm um, I'm a little bit doubt on that because you know that with the one man rule, um, it's very hard for any. As we see the wolf, uh, wolf warrior uh, diplomacy, that we thought that it would be very damaged to the the Chinese image, but it keep going on on that. And also the second issue that also agree with the uh, ambassador Suri is that we see that the the pursuance. Of and it's true continues. And I think that uh, that set the one uh, centenary of the uh, the uh, Chinese, uh, established the Chinese party. And also we have to see also the goal in, uh, uh, I mean, 100 years established of the PRC. We also see that the China aspire to be uh, a great power. I mean, um, not only great power, but a superpower it does seem equal footing with the US and even, you know, maybe dominate the, the surrounding areas. And I think that it will going on and the China's will keep on that type of until, of course, you know, very, very important factor is that it's not only Chinese aspiration, but also the reaction from the world. And of course, at work, I see that in part of uh, appeasement is the culture is done work any way, you know, that also create inviting more the world uh, the agree and to see that you know it very uh, is not very helpful for China to this course. Or uh, otherwise, you know, the same thing that we see that may the world is more accommodative, inviting more uh, assertive and expressionisms. Thanks. Is that, that my observation? Very personal observation on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great points. Uh, over to you, Dr. Swanson. You, if you have anything to add. Well, no. I, I think what we we're going to see near see in the near. I, I think what we've seen also is that China has been a bit more moderate, um, not against all states. I think it's important to figure that out. I mean, when you take to look at Taiwan. We can debate if that is state or not. Then, of course, Taiwan has not declared independence, but uh, the Chinese government has been much more assertive of what they consider the sort of the renegade province um, up to now. But then you then you start looking what it done towards Europe and other states. They've been much more moderate up to the anniversary, uh, but. I don't see that as anything else than a strategy. I mean, this is a short term gain because they don't want confusion or sort of, you know, chaos during the anniversary. But um, the Chinese has been very good uh, in sort of pressing on and, and increasing pressure on states and everything, and then decreasing it and then increasing it and decreasing it. 
they've been very skillful in using that. And I think this is exactly what we see. Um, but um, when it comes to Taiwan and the maritime claims, it seems like that's where they're really going to push forward on. Um, I mean, I've been a student in China. I came the first time in 89. So, I mean, I probably came before some, some of the audience was born. Uh, but uh, I'm actually, to share the ambassador's view, I mean, I'm very concerned here. I mean, I'm not going back right now because, you know, I have been critical of um, both what happens in Xinjiang and, and Hong Kong and, of course, what you've what you done to Taiwan. So um, China is taking definitely one step up when it comes to punishing individuals and states and I'm, I'm very concerned where we're going I, i'm not going to say i'm concerned where china's going i'm concerned where this, the communist party is going and i do think that um, china is absolutely dependent on pushing back on the liberal society because this is something i noticed when i was in but when i lived in china Democracy is a threat to internal stability. Um, the whole idea about uh, democratic society and students who wish to be more, have a more say in politics, etc., is a threat to, to uh, the Communist Party security. Not to national security necessarily, but to the security of the Communist Party. And I think we have to be very clear in separating the state and the party. When I criticize well, I, 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 you tend to use the word China, but I, I normally criticize the Communist Party's politics. China as a state, of course, I, th I think I welcome that, and I, I, I definitely welcome that to be stronger and more influential. But it's rather how the Communist Party takes a very aggressive foreign policy. So I'll, I'll stop there. Very interesting points. In fact, you mentioned about skillfully, in fact, how skillfully they have, uh, you know, done this campaign in creating the pressures and reducing the allies uh, for Taiwan. In fact, just a few years back, Taiwan was having 19 or 20 international allies. Now they are reduced to 50. So very pertinent points here. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Cho Ping. You have, you have something to add? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Jaga, I think there was a question that was addressed to me. Uh, should I answer here or is, is there a discussion Q&A later? Or, uh, uh, the, the question was that how do you see the 100 years of the uh, yeah, yeah. Chinese Communist Party and uh, do you think the Chinese are going to revisit about their aggressive approach from here on? How do you see the Communist Party or China as a country is responding? Yes, yes, yes. That one I will. Okay, I think, uh, yes, uh, they are going to celebrate their 100th uh, anniversary and they are, Xi Jinping, I think every China watcher is familiar that there is a blueprint 2020, 2035, 2050, and this is, uh, they are kind of the fulfilling the first uh, 100th anniversary and then of course later they have the second 100th anniversary 200 years later. Um, I think while the rest of the world are getting very concerned about the directions of China, rightly so in many instances, uh, I think the problem is that within China, the I would say, based on my own understanding, um, they are not that much concerned about how the rest of the world are concerned about them. Uh, they seem to be quite confident. They seem to be thinking that China has taken a correct direction. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party, for all uh, no uh, flaws of having demonstrated the ability to rule the country for decades, to overcome all the obstacles, obstacles, and the current international environment would just be another obstacle uh, for the Communist Party leadership uh, to overcome. Uh, in that sense, I would feel that uh, there will be not major change of direction, uh, perhaps some little adjustment here and there, uh, but if you would ask me to predict whether there will be a major change of direction, I, uh, I would doubt so. Uh, I would think that there will still, I, I, I can feel that they are quite confident the way of the, 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 the way that the, the government, the country is going. The popular support of the country, 
uh, whether we want to doubt you no know, under uh, uh, control information how genuine uh, I mean how how genuine is those popular support this but I do believe that the, the, the government the party itself uh, at the moment perhaps really enjoy a high level of support uh, the Chinese people looking at the, the, the way the pandemic is being uh, handled in different countries and they will basically see China as not necessarily the, the, the kind of a very evil regime that many foreign observers have uh, attributed to the Communist Party. Uh, they will say that yes, the Communist Party, the government has done uh, no incorrect or, or make mistakes here and there, but overall, uh, the, the direction of the country doesn't seem to be incorrect. Uh, this is as far as I can tell how the major uh, direction uh, will continue to be. Of course, I'm not saying that there are very uh, segments of the population that are very critical of the Chinese government, but I don't think they have any input the way that the, the, way that the, the government will be going in the years to come. Uh, so that is uh, my assessment. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Choping. Uh, over to you, Professor Gorani. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Panda. Uh, at first, I want to say that from the Party Congress, I agree uh, with Professor Sandstorm. Uh, and also, I can add that uh, after the Communist Party Congress, the authoritarian and totalitarian regime will continue. Uh, but also, uh, Xi Jinping uh, ambitions, global ambitions, will increase as well. You know, uh, from the European perspective, uh, China is perceived as clumsy giant, giant but clumsy giant. You know, uh, as you acknowledge after my presentation, Lithuania pulls out of 17 plus one framework a month ago already a month ago, but it is not institutionally recognized as that. Uh, when uh, the foreign minister of Lithuania uh, stated that Lithuania will withdraw fro from the framework, uh, th then the Chinese officials uh, declared that uh, 70 plus one framework is not institution, is not institutional creation, is more coordinative mechanism. So everybody can uh, uh, in or out whenever they want, but uh, our mutual interests are above all. So they do not recognize the withdrawing of the Lithuania from the framework. Uh, in the meantime, in parallel, the Chinese authorities focused uh, its policy towards Western Balkans, because Western Balkans is a uh, merely disintegrated uh, region in Europe. Uh, some uh, uh, countries are member states of European Union, some of them are not member states, such as Macedonia, for example. And the Chinese authorities uh, seek an opportunity to penetrate in the Western Balkans and to oppose the United States' influence in it in order to influence the Europe as well. Uh, in the Western Balkans, Chinese uh, authorities, Chinese government is uh, uh, very close with Serbian government, with uh, current President Alexander Vucic, and uh, the pandemic was, uh, and, and the pandemic gave an additional value to their partnership uh, via vaccine diplomacy. So, uh, with vaccines, with uh, foreign direct investments, with cheap credits, uh, with Serbia, with Macedonia, with Montenegro, with Bosnia and Herzegovina, with Albania as well, China uh, tends to stick to Europe, regardless of the other European Union member states and uh, European countries. And uh, also, I want to acknowledge that the Lithuanian withdrawal, the Lithuanian withdrawal was, con uh, uh, was, uh, 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 was confirmed by one of the one sentence 
stated by the Lithuanian foreign uh, minister, who said that the next cooperation and coordination mechanism with China should be 27 plus 1, not 17 plus 1. Uh, implying that uh, from now on, the European Union should organize itself to communicate with China as one block. But this is very problematic because you have Czech Republic, you have Slovakia, you have Hungary, and also you have Germany. And Germany is uh, very as a great trade partner with China. So the Lithuania is not a problem uh, in one hand, but the biggest countries in Europe, uh, like Germany and France also, are uh, making the problems with China because they conduct their policy from national perspective, uh, not from the perspective and for the sake of the European Union. And that is the problem. But I think that, uh, as I said in my presentation, the European naivety is uh, ended. I hope that cooperation between European Union, United States of America and other countries in the world will create an atmosphere, an ambient, a global ambient in which the China cannot uh, use its aggressive uh, uh, ambition, uh, its predatory, uh, predatoric ambition, and to uh, start uh, to follow the rules of uh, the rules of the civilized world and to respect the other countries and their interests because we know that uh, its aggressiveness uh, created uh, uh, damage to many countries as well in Macedonia they financed one railroad in Macedonia but it is uh, already defunct they started to finance it and they're already defined, uh, defunct. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Banloi, you have uh, any com comments to offer? Yes, uh, since 2016, the Communist Party of China has been uh, doing what we call the political party diplomacy in the Philippines. And the uh, CPC has been uh, pursuing uh, dialogues not only with dominant political parties in the Philippines, uh, the party of President Duterte, but also with the opposition party, uh, like the Liberal Party, which is in fact associated with the, with the, with the United States. So uh, I had a real privilege of observing some of their uh, activities in the Philippines. And in my observation, the CPC after 100 years has transformed a lot and it has pursued a lot of innovations. Uh, and uh, I, in, in, in my impression, the Communist Party of China is no longer the same Communist Party that uh, I knew during the Cold War. Right now, the uh, Communist Party of China is more, more open to, uh, to pursue dialogues with uh, many political parties in the world. And in my uh, observation in the Philippines uh, and even my interactions with uh, their uh, officials, especially the International Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, uh, they are uh, in fact now open to listen to um, many, uh, many uh, thoughts and many uh, ideas. Of course, we have differences when it comes to the issue of the South China Sea. But the good thing is that uh, the Communist Party of China is now uh, opening its channels of communications with existing political parties in Asia. And uh, I, uh, I uh, witnessed how the Communist Party of China is doing effective dialogues with, uh, with uh, existing political parties in the Philippines. So um, 100 years uh, after the founding of the Communist Party of China, I can say that China has changed tremendously from a very close political party to uh, the more open, uh, engaging, 
and now involved in uh, diplomacy and we call that the party uh, diplomacy but however uh, although i am optimistic of its uh, current activities in the philippines i'm still very cautious because we have existing uh, communist party in the philippines pursuing a uh, maoist ideology and uh, the communist party of china reiterated that it is not supporting the armed activities of the Communist Party of the Philippines. So in that regard, I can see that the Communist Party uh, of China is becoming more and more uh, constructive and engaging when dealing with uh, political parties uh, in the Philippines. So that's only my, uh, my observations based on uh, uh, their party diplomacy in the Philippines. Uh, and I hope that uh, after 100 years of the foundation of the Communist Party of China, the CPC is continuously to transform itself so that its demonized image in the world will be eventually changed. Okay. But uh, again, I need to reiterate that uh, in the Philippines, there's still a lot of uh, criticism against the Communist Party of China and there's still a very strong anti-China attitude uh, in the Philippines, partly because of our colonial experiences. You know, we were, we were colonized by countries with strong anti-China attitude, you know, Spain, uh, United States, uh, Japan, and uh, briefly uh, Great Britain. So we inherited that kind of uh, anti-China sentiment and the Communist Party of China is trying to uh, address that issue. And currently, the main source of anti-China sentiment in the Philippines, we call it the xenophobia, is China's increased military and paramilitary activities in the South China Sea, particularly in the West Philippine Sea. So unless the Communist Party of China uh, orders its people to um, to uh, slow down its uh, military and paramilitary activities in the, in the Philippines, it will have a difficult time uh, erasing this xenophobia prevailing among Filipino people. So that's the challenge for the Communist Party of China for its next 100 years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have roughly 10 minutes for discussion and we have already one question. Uh, maybe I would invite uh, all the attendants, the participants to pose their questions if they have any questions in the chat box um, so that we can uh, ask the speakers to address those questions. But I could already see one question which is addressed towards uh, Dr. Cho Ping. Um, is it uh, in China's interest to ignore the existing international order established after World War II? Maybe uh, Dr. Cho Ping, you may like to address these questions maybe very briefly in two to three minutes and so that uh, we can take uh, some additional questions if there are any. Yes, uh, very briefly. Uh, first of all, I think we have to answer what is liberal international order. It's a very abstract, sometimes even a very mythical term. I don't think China ever subscribed that they have been uh, following in liberal international order. They have been following some kind of international order, but in their own conception, is exactly what I say, it's a liberal international order, inclusive of both liberal and illiberal elements within it. Um, their version of, of international order is UN-based since they joined the United Nations and have been saying that that is the order they subscribe to. Um, they have participated and have benefited from the liberal international order, but not exclusively, not wholly, not entirely, right? And that is how they would see it. I wouldn't say that it's in their own interest to overthrow, the so-called overthrow the liberal international order. But again, the, the fundamental question is, what is liberal international order? They embrace certain selective elements within it, uh, but not others. And liberal international order as a mythical kind of concept is also very never clear about each of the elements, who are who and, and what, which, which of the which of the partners or members are doing exactly what fulfilling the so-called this international liberal international order. So that will be my brief answer. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, thank you for that, um, um, you know, a very useful answer. Uh, we don't have, I don't really see any other questions, but we do have only five minutes. Maybe um, I would just uh, ask one last uh, point for discussion and then we, we can wind up and each speaker can just uh, share their thoughts maybe in 
30 seconds or in one minute. How do you really see the uh, revival of the China model or the China Inc? The image that the Chinese uh, leadership had uh, built uh, all these years in their favor. Of course, we do agree that probably, um, you know, um, China would still continue to emerge as a uh, prominent economic power and their economic diplomacy would uh, really go probably from here on to a different level because uh, it was in 2008 and 9 we did see Chinese actually came to the rescue of the global economy and there was a different diplomacy we saw there that time. Probably it's this a kind of a replication of the same diplomacy we might see this time in order to recover from the pandemic and to put the global economic order in, in, in frame. But uh, I would like to in, you know, invite each of the distinguished panel to comments maybe in 30 seconds or in one minute. How do you see the prospects of the China model that uh, the Chinese previous leadership, including Xi Jinping, was capitalizing on to campaign further and to brand uh, and sell the China's image uh, worldwide? Uh, do you think uh, that image has been has gone through a setback? And uh, there is a prospect that, that at some point they can revive that image. What do you think? If you could uh, comment on this, that would be very useful. Ambassador Suri, maybe I could begin with you, sir. Thank you. I think you asked a very difficult but an extremely pertinent question in the present context. I think uh, let's stick to the economic side because the politics is very different. I think China has been an enormous beneficiary of the rule-based international order in the trade side. I use these words very carefully. You had a GATT and you had a WTO. And I think the fact, and that is why you may have heard in my presentation that I have said that the Communist Party of China, particularly in the post Deng Xiaoping, in the Deng Xiaoping era, has very conveniently interpreted aspects of the WTO and earlier the GATT to benefit the Chinese economy. Now, uh, the problem is, depend which side of the argument you're on, the WTO is either broke or it's not broke, or it's almost broke and it needs to be uh, reformed. Now, I think the problem the Chinese are going to face is that there is a new form of globalization now underway. You can call it decoupled globalization. You can what, give it whatever term you want to. I, I have no strong views on that. But the fact is that Mr. Trump started a process. Mr. Biden is continuing it. And now, as our colleagues from Europe have said, Europe is very much on board. I think if you use a particular set of agreements to which you signed on, to take one-sided benefit from, then you have to ultimately end up paying a price for that. And I think the Chinese economy has begun to pay that price. Now, whether they can rectify that depends on how they approach the problem. Uh, so far, I have seen no signs of their approaching the problem in a manner to reform the WTO on a consensus basis that will not just benefit the Chinese model, but the international economy as a whole. And that is why I said the BRI to my mind is creation of a cosmos, a new cosmos. You know, I don't think China is yet in a position to create that new cosmos, replace the WTO and have a system there which is internationally consensus based and which is increasingly to Chinese advantage. I think some of the actions they have taken in recent years have put them back, even their strongest supporters of Western industry who still bank, uh, still depend upon the Chinese market and favor leaner liberal approach to China are beginning to change track. If not voluntarily, then under pressure from their public opinion and their governments. So I think that would be my answer. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Haito, quickly, your thoughts? Just very quickly that, uh, I mean, in order to China to change the course, I think it's very important to have either maybe domestic pressures and also the also international pressures on that and domestically i don't haven't seen anything until you know you see that uh, there are significant changes in the uh, economic development or economic growth on the part of china and of course uh, i mean on the uh, international political front i haven't seen you know the uh, substantial i mean how can significant international pressures or alignments uh, against the chinese the communist party or maybe as a professor uh, Swan Sun said that, you know, is, um, China is, is so far quite good and sophisticated to divide and, and rules and offer the benefits and at the same time 
you know, offer the punishments for any actions that they want. So I think that is is a very difficult environment, and we see that it much more dependent on the, you know the behavior of other countries uh, that give this significantly signal for China's that set of behavior is not uh, undesirable. Thank you, Dr. Swanson. Very quickly. Yeah, I, I think actually, I mean, the, the Chinese model is alive and well. I mean, what what you see is that. A lot of totalitarian states and totalitarian politicians appreciate the model because it's a non, it's a live and let live model. Um, whatever we do to our own citizens is really not your concern. So, I think it it has a certain attractiveness and especially the economic success. The only thing we can actually do is to offer alternatives. We need to be able to create a call it a democrat or liberal option where we provide economic alternatives, but also diplomatic alternatives. Trump was not mentioned. I think he did more damage to the liberal order than China would <laughs> have been able to do so far. Um, so I think it, it's, it's about time that we create alternative supply lines. We create alternative models of interaction. So if we can offer an alternative to the Chinese model, we really have to step up. And I'm, then I'm talking weed, it's India, Japan, Europe, United States, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I don't see that really, unfortunately. I completely agree with you. In fact, very quickly, I think uh, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal is reminding me that we just have one minute. Dr. Choping, you want to say something very quickly? In 30 minutes. All right, very quickly then. Uh, I don't think China model is replicable. Uh, is I would say it's too unique to its own, have a lot of very unique characteristics, but it will inspire, I think, inspire a little bit less confidence in the efficacy of liberal democracy. I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying liberal democracy will not be important in many developing world, but it will just be one set of a number of values. And then they will find other values in the China model uh, other than liberal democracy. All right, I'll stop there. Agree. Uh, Professor Goranian, uh, quickly. You're, please unmute your mic, please. Uh, thank you very much. I share my opinion with uh, the previous uh, colleagues. So I think that the Chinese model is unique, but also uh, uh, the world need to provide uh, some uh, another uh, alternatives also and to uh, to preserve the core of a liberal democratic order and that is human rights and civil liberties. That is the main point. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Van Lui? Yes, thank you very much. As a Southeast Asian scholar studying China for more than 30 years, I consider the Chinese model as uh, appealing because it supports the ASEAN way. So, uh, and uh, it also reaffirms the uh, ASEAN way. So, uh, the model that China is now trying to uh, promote is uh, being considered by uh, by members of the ASEAN, but at the same time, very cautious of its possible implications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those wonderful remarks. And uh, at the end, let me thank uh, all the panelists here for their rich and insightful remarks. It was really indeed a great pleasure and privilege for me to moderate this session. And uh, personally, it's been a truly learning experience for me uh, with this esteemed ambassador, Ambassador Suri, Dr. Swanson, uh, Dr. Rahaito, uh, Professor Chauping, Professor Kolan Yilk, and uh, Dr. Van Loy. Um, it's been a wonderful session with you. And uh, we stay in touch and probably I'll encourage all the participants to pose their questions and stay in touch with the speakers if they have any further questions. Due to the constraint of time, we are unable to take it forward. But thank you very much for your uh, time and being here. It's been a wonderful session so far. And uh, with this note, let me hand over the session to Dr. Pramod Joyswal, uh, the director of this institute uh, who, who has been instrumental in arranging this conflict. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Panda, and all the distinguished speakers for the wonderful discussion. It was a great learning experience. Here we come to the end of this session. Now we'll move to the next session immediately because the